So the next thing I want to do is kind of summarize up our, our orbital forces, which influence satellites about the Earth, by talking about how orbital these perturbations also influence the orbit of the Earth about the Sun. So that you get a kind of a conceptual view of, of some, what scale and magnitude of these forces are. It's also interesting to study because this is one of the most influential aspects of, uh, in terms of impact on climate change, long-term climate change. But that's sort of an interesting topic. And in fact, a lot of people are, are looking at satellite systems that do um, climate surveying and things. So it's always nice to be kind of literate in, in these types of uh, uh, scientific fields. So let's take a look at the field of orbital forcing to summarize some of these forces. Helps get our terminology down as well. Orbital forcing is the study of perturbations of Earth orbit about the sun and the effects on the Earth's climate. Some of these concepts that we've talked about come into play here. So for example, one of the, the things which we can study in this class and we know about is the eccentricity of the orbit. So the current Earth orbit is not a perfect circle. It has an eccentricity of E equals to about 0.012. So it's pretty close to circular. But it does have an aphelion and a perihelion. So if you draw that on the board, let's say here's the sun. And I'll go ahead and exaggerate this. There is a point where it's basically farther away. This is aphelion. And then on the opposite side of the solar system, there is a point perihelion where it is closest to the sun. And of course, during the course of the, the Earth's revolution about the, uh, the sun, we would expect, obviously, the, the Earth to be warmer when we're close to perihelion and colder when we're over at aphelion. It doesn't make that much of a difference, but it doesn't take that much <clears throat> variation to see something significant build up over time. <clears throat> so interestingly, the Earth's eccentricity wobbles over time due to some of these orbital perturbation forces that we look at. And so one of the, the Jupiter is probably the biggest culprit because it's the most massive non-Sun thing in the solar system. And as a result, the Earth's eccentricity will wobble between 0 0.005 to about 0 0.058. So kind of an order of magnitude change there. And this happens on a fairly large 413,000 year cycle with some smaller cycles in between. OK, so let's think. If the mean radius stays about the same, would you expect much change if you get an eccentric orbit? Like right now, we're, we're not very eccentric. We're 0 .00, 0 0.012. That's pretty close to the uh, most circular the Earth gets, the Earth's orbit gets. If we got a, a more eccentric Earth orbit, how might that change something? Well, if the mean radius doesn't change, our first inclination would be, wow, you know, in, uh, this thing gets more eccentric. This is going to shorten up. This is going to broaden up. Half the year, I'm going to get a little bit less 
solar energy. The other year, I'm going to get, the other part of the year, I'm going to get a little bit more. They should roughly cancel, right? Oh, but wait a second. There's Kepler's second law. That comes into play here. It's very interesting. Remember, the Earth would travel faster in perihelion than it would travel in aphelion. So if it gets more eccentric, yeah, this part gets warmer, this part gets colder, but you spend more time in the cold. And over time, this builds up. And we find this is one of the, the um, key con contributions for uh, ice ages. They can use some of these orbital forcing uh, effects to predict the cycles of ice ages and also interglacial periods when ice is sort of uh, proceeding and receding on the surface of the Earth. So this is a big one. And it's an irregular Earth. Uh, the tugging of Jupiter and the other planets that are causing this in a semi-predictable manner. <laughs>